What's up, everyone? What's up, my friend Randy? Can you guys hear me? This is how brain turns work. I'm in a car. I'm leaving Brooklyn. I just did an operation. Now I'm traveling to Lenox. Um, but I wanted to take a second to introduce uh, you guys, because um, I love you guys. So Danilo Silva is a brain tumor surgeon, um, really all around neurosurgeon, but brain tumor surgeon, uh, working out of Westchester, part of the Northwell group, part of the Lenox Hill group, um, part of the family, if you will. Um, and, you know, he's a uh, Brazilian um, by birth, I believe. And uh, he ended up here. And we have Dr. Ben Shalom, who you guys met yesterday, um, our current neuroplastics fellow, taking an attending job soon in the world, but currently part of our family as well. Uh, brain tumor neuroplastic specialist and um, came here from Israel. And one question we get a lot, especially, you know, with what I talked about yesterday, the fact that, that brain tumor has allowed us to go global, to appeal to all these people uh, who are super interested in medicine is the question of, well, you know, how do I, how do I get to where I want to be, whether it's in my country or how do I get to where I want to be in a successful place like Northwell in the U.S. or, you know, a major academic institution? And, you know, when I heard, when I thought about this, you guys were the first people I thought about because, you know, you guys did it, right? You guys are successful in this. And that's a huge thing. It's a huge triumph. And I think that our students would love to hear from you guys. You know, I think, you know, Danilo, if you want to start or if not, you want to start, you guys figure it out. But, you know, just go through your story. How did you get to where you are? Um, and, you know, I think let's make it interactive. Let's make it fun. I'll listen along and try to chime in with questions. Quinn, the same thing, right? I may lose service as I drive through Brooklyn here. This is Brooklyn. You guys can see it. But anyway, um, yeah. So why don't you guys, uh, why don't you get started? And, you know, we'll spend this hour just talking about, you know, giving advice on these students who are super interested in neurosurgery about how the hell do you become a neurosurgeon, especially if you're coming from another country. Thanks, Randy. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I prepared some slides. So, Danilo, if you want to go ahead and I don't know if you pre prepare some slides, I just prepared some nice slides with pictures and um, just to go over the journey. But up to you if you want to start or how do you want to do that? You can get started, Nadi. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm happy to be here. Thank you again, Randy, for the invitation. This is a wonderful education opportunity. As you mentioned, it's a global event now. You can get started on it. I think that's perfectly fine. I can go go after All you. Right. I have some stuff needed. I can show as well. Awesome. So I'll be I'll be quick. I'll just go uh, real quick. Thanks to Lilo. I think this is exciting times to see so many FMGs and IMGs and people around the world want to listen about want to learn about neurosurgery and how uh, specifically we're doing it Northwell and I couldn't be more humble and privileged to work in this uh, amazing system so I'll just go over um, I'll just go over come on. Yeah. so I'll just go over a little bit about my story and how I got to uh, where I am today and um, and um, and uh, feel free to stop me any time to ask questions and then Danilo will, will take over. So uh, I'm Nati, I'm a, a neuroplastic fellow here at Lenox Say Hill, hi, but Daniel. I will. But then uh, the story actually begins with that quote. And I think I'll, you know, um, I would say if I, if I have to, if I have to say thank you to somebody along this journey is to my mentors, right? Uh, Isaac Newton said, if I've seen further is by standing on the shoulder of giants. And I think that uh, my story, uh, I couldn't agree more with that. And, and those are the people along the way or just some of the people that I really need to give a shout out or my mentors uh, here and all over the world that sort of, you'll hear you know, uh, within my slides how everybody comes into play with this little story. Uh, basically, um, you know, I've been, to some places, right? I was born and raised in Israel. I did my medical school in Hungary, and then I traveled around the globe, both Europe, Israel, the US, to sort of different institutions until I came here. And all of this to basically acquire skills, right? Skills in neurosurgery are not only surgical, but they are clinical, and you need to have situational awareness and operative room etiquette and leadership. And it's a lot of different th skills that you learn along the way. And, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't you know, I would say that by being well-rounded and traveled, I think you, you acquire those things, uh, you know, with with passive and uh, and active learning. So, how did I turn out from a young uh, uh, boy from Haifa, which is a little city in uh, in, in in Israel, to uh, being a New York uh, New York-based neurosurgeon? 
And let me tell you, that wasn't an easy ride. So Haifa is a very nice little town in the northern border of Israel. We have beaches and beautiful view and mountains everywhere. But I was a terrible student. I didn't like to go to school. I would rather spend my time at the beach, surfing, playing guitar or, or skateboarding. I wasn't, I wasn't an excellent student. And uh, that's because I had an ADHD. I, I, I had an undiagnosed ADHD uh, during my, my high school years and preschool years. And, and, and uh, I wasn't a good student. Uh, I, I didn't like to go to school. I, I didn't find school interesting and I failed. I failed in most of the tests actually. And then I joined the military. Uh, in Israel, you have to go to the military for uh, at least three years. I did four years of special forces training, which really changed my mindset. As a special forces paramedic, you you know you get to see all those crazy terror attacks and mass casualty events and uh, and uh, unfortunately war. And uh, being a paramedic really laid the foundation to become a doctor and treating you know emergency and and life life-threatening conditions and I think it's not only changed my man mindset from being a you know a punk skater boy but also to think about the future and about career and the disciplines that I learned uh, uh, actually you know gave me the foundation to go to med school and I went to med school in Hungary which is in the middle of Europe in a little town called Debrecen uh, you can imagine that as, a, as someone that never went to school and never, you know, never got good grades going to a, to a med school uh, in the middle of Europe in English, which was not, is not my native language, was kind of challenging. But med school was a lot of fun, obviously a lot of studies, but, but again, being in the center of Europe, we've been walking around, going to ski trips, made a lot of friends from all over the world. And then you see in the right bottom picture, I wasn't really sure what I want to do. So you study medicine and surgery and I was, wasn't was really sure what, what is it I want to do. So I took a semester in Copenhagen, which was another opportunity to spend some time in a different country and learn some languages and have fun with, uh, you know, with other uh, students and did my first U.S. space rotation in plastic surgery actually in the University of Southwestern in Dallas, Texas, which was the first time actually being exposed to an American system. And uh, this department in, in Houston is very well known for the plastic surgery uh, uh, service. And it's, and it, I must say it was the first, um, you, you know, wetting, wetting my hands and my, and my feet for the first time made me realize I really like the structure of practicing uh, medicine in the US. Uh, after graduating med school, I had to be decide what to do and I needed to, I wanted to get my Israeli medical license. So I went to do my internship in uh, Sheba Tel Shomel, where I met a very special guy named Dr. Mark Arkowitz, which is a pediatric uh, uh, surgeon, a general surgeon that told me, listen, go get a SEBA. If you want to practice the USA, go do a SEBA at, uh, in New York. And he made some emails and I found myself on the airplane to New York City be wearing a suit, I would say, for the first time in my life when I was, uh, you know, 20, uh, uh, 20 something years old, going to the big city to do a SEBA in NYU. And seven months later, I was interviewed for a PGY-1. So basically, you know, this, 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 the SEBA laid a foundation for an interview to get me into a residency program in general surgery. On the left picture, this is me in the neurosurgery call room. So I had a one month in the neurosurgery department where I met this guy, Dr. Sean Rogers, which is another giant. He was uh, he was basically a chief resident at the time when I was a PGY-1. And he told me, listen, I think that you really like neurosurgery. I, you know, uh, go check it out. I think you're going to be good at it. And, you know, I didn't like to do rectal exams too much in general surgery. So I switched to uh, neurosurgery. But... I did not want to spend another year to apply in the U.S., so I went to Sweden. Why Sweden? Karolinska Institute is a very well-known, um, you know, hospital and university where they give the Nobel Prize. And I had some friends from med school at that department, so I went and spent a year in the neurosurgery department, being sort of like a one-year uh, first-year resident or a shadow wear. I did scrub into surgeries and I took calls. But it was mostly to make sure that this is what I want to do. After this one year, I engaged in this uh, endeavor of, uh, of, of, of uh, medical device, which uh, I failed in. I, I really wanted to 
I had an idea to do some something with a, with a transfernoidal surgery, and I wrote a patent, and I and, and I failed really fast. So I had to go back to Israel to uh, finish my my residency, as my company was supposed to be built in Israel. After starting a residency, I knew I had no uh, no chance in the world to run another business, and I dropped you know my idea and and had a pretty intense residency training in Israel, in Tel Aviv, in one of the largest uh, hospital called Rabin Medical Center, where I met my second mentor, or third mentor, which is Dr. Sagi Hardoff, my chairman. And again, he taught me everything that I know. And once again, if I since further, is by standing off the shoulder of this giant that not only taught me how to operate, but how to be a person, how to be a dad, how to be a family member, and how to be you know, a human being. And uh, then I got married during my, my residency to my wife, which has become a major change in my entire career. Having this support system in your home really changed everything for me. Uh, one day, my chairman at my residency called me and showed me this book, as you see in a bit of the special field of neurosurgery, and said to me, you're an excellent, you, you know, an excellent resident. I want to send you for a research fellowship at Johns Hopkins. Where do you want to go? And, you know, I opened the book right away and I told him I'm going to go and do a neuroplastic surgery research fellowship. So he made some phone calls and I found myself on the airplane to Baltimore. And I did almost uh, eight months of research fellowship in neuroplastic surgery, which is extremely unique and new subspecialty that was developed not, you know, not so many years back. And luckily, uh, I got the uh, scholarship to do that. It wrote some very good papers in between uh, lab work. I also had my first ch first child born, uh, and when I graduated, you know, I knew that um, this is what I want to do a clinical fellowship in, and I was invited to come back as a clinical fellow. This is my mentor, Dr. Chet Gordon and Dr. Judy Wong, which are the program directors. I gave talks about my research all over the world, Harvard Hopkins Symposium, uh, Paris, Israel, just to just to show you how uh, you know one opportunity lays a foundation for another one and how you can escalate. And after that, I, I came back to my residency program and applied many of the things that I learned in my research. I know those those are all articles in the mainstream media about my research back at home. And then I had the opportunity to be uh, participate in this show called the Resident. All right, so hopefully you guys understood the Hebrew, but I was at this uh, in this show called The Residence, which is sort of like the Lennox Hill uh, show in Israel, got, you know, mainstream exposure, which was a big, you know, interesting experience, actually, very interesting experience. And after I graduated my residency, I came back to Hopkins as a clinical fellow that was very nice to come back to an old friend that I met during my research fellowship. And uh, when I graduated, uh, you know, again, my mentor is Dr. Chet Gordon, which is a founder and program director of neuroplastic surgery, Judy Wong and Henry Brand, the chairman. It really, you know, set the stage to uh, what I want to do uh, in my career. And um, and then uh, this guy on the right side, name is, you know, is Elis Nosek. Dr. Elis Nosek is an NYU attending, uh, and he is... Um, one of my very good friends and mentors along the way. And he told me back in 2017, when he was a fellow here at Lenox Hill, he said, come check it out. And this is actually the picture from April, 2017. And this is where I got introduced to Dr. Langer and Dr. Um, uh, Bukvar. And uh, when I finished my training or before my training at Hopkins, he said, listen, why don't you come back and do your tumor fellowship here at Lenox Hill? This is a great place. It's very unique, very, um, um, uh, you know, very advanced, pushing the envelope. I think you'll like it. And um, I told him, you know, I met those guys back in 2017. Sure, I'll interview again. And I interviewed before I started my fellowship at Hopkins. And this is how I ended up here. Uh, you know, I don't know if to call it serendipity or I don't know if to call it like how, this is how the stars aligned. But 
so far the time in Lenox Hill was has been amazing. You know, I'm surrounded by a group of really visionaries and, and mentors uh, everywhere. So you walk down the hallway and you can talk to Dr. Bukvar, which is a world known neurosurgeon and Dr. Langer, which is a world known neurosurgeons, uh, you know, every minute. And I don't think you get this opportunity anywhere else that I could be more happy to uh, to, to spend uh, my time here uh, as, a, as a fellow. Luckily, uh, we have a great team and it's not only about the, you know yourself or the surgeon, it's an entire big team that you share the experience with. Otherwise, you know, it's not even worth it. Um, other things that I like to do and, you know, and I need to thank for is my family that without this, you know, support, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. And those are some activities that we like to do. And on the free time, my favorite things to do is to surf with my wife. We, uh, you know, we, I, we got married in the Maldives and we, uh, and we surfed in Sri Lanka and surfed around the world. And now I start to climb with my little, you know, young daughter, Lenny. And, and um, this is, you know, the big ending, the, I'm almost ending my talk by saying that all of this and, and um, you know, wherever I am right now wouldn't be uh, possible without the amazing support that you get from your family and mentors and my mom and dad, you see here in the picture, my sister, my younger sister that got married and my older sister, her kid or her husband. And, and this you know, amazing support system is, you know, is what, at least for me, it was the most critical part of my of my training and where I am right now. Uh, and I would like to end, you know, this is my last slide, I think. Um, so if you had to give me, uh, you know, a one-liner to summarize my presentation of how did I make it to the U.S. and how did I, as an FMG and an and IMG from a small town in Haifa, a kid that had a, you know, severe ADHD and did not barely completed high school to being the top of my class, uh, top graduate at Hopkins, neuroplastic fellow, oncology fellow in the best institution in the world, Lennox Hill, and, and, and an attending neurosurgeon in New York, I would say two things. One is find yourself good fellows, right? Good fellows and uh, and support system like your family and mentors. You know, if I, I, I owe everything to my mentors, the one that taught me how to be a person, how to operate, how to be a family member along the way. And and essentially, you know, I learned from their mistake. And and the second thing that I wanted to, 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 to remember is that without grit and without perseverance, we wouldn't be anywhere. So this is my grandmother on the right side when she was just 14, her entire family was executed in the Holocaust. And in the middle, you see her report. Essentially, she's giving, she's giving the testimony how her entire family was evaporated in the Holocaust. And she was 14 when she had to walk uh, barefoot on, uh, on the snow of Russia around 100 miles until she found a shelter. And, um, and she did that just by herself, just the power to be alive, succeed, and, and, and to get somewhere. And I think that, you know, those are the little things that we can learn from our, you know, ancestors is, is greed and perseverance and the desire to be successful and get somewhere. And on the left side, this is with uh, my grandmother, her grandfather, her husband, and my dad, which was young. And this is just before she passed away. She managed to uh, raise this amazing family with kids and grandkids and, and grand grandkids. So this is her own little victory. I'm saying that because, you know, the, the final, I would say, the, the final, the, the final um, message that I would like to give you guys is, uh, you know, passion, perseverance can get you anywhere you want in life. Just find good mentors and support system. That's it for me. Thanks so much, Daddy. I want to wait. Um, I, I want to ask you guys a bunch of questions, and I'm sure the students do too. But why don't we let Danilo go, um, and uh, and we'll kind of convene at the end and talk to you guys about kind of the common themes, common threads that go between both journeys. Obviously, everyone's everyone's story is very different, um, and it's always so fascinating to hear where people came from and what what drove them. So, Danilo, man, tell us tell us about you. Great talk again, uh, uh, amazing, amazing experience, Nadi. We are so lucky and fortunate to have somebody like you here. Uh, simply amazing. Thank you. Thank you. There's no words to describe how amazing your trajectory is. Uh, let me try to share my screen a uh, second.
looks like it's not going. So this is not going around here, my bad. There should be a button at the bottom of your screen that says share screen. Yeah, so, uh, that's what I'm trying to. Maybe you want to do some of the questions, Randy, but first. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Yeah, uh, you just make sure you're, you're selecting the right app. Usually with a share screen, it gives you a window opportunity. But yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think um, if we want to address some of the students' comments, I think uh, I don't, I mean, it's hard for me on a phone. Quinn, if you can take a look at the chat and see if there are any main questions. I think, you know, the main thing is this idea of kind of mentorship. People want to know how do they identify a mentor? How do they know who is a mentor, right? Um, and so, you know, Nadi, while Danilo's pulling this up, I mean, how do you, how do you think you recognize someone as a mentor? Where, when does that cross the line between some guy you met and, or some girl you met and a, and a mentor? Great question, Randy. Thank you. So I think that mentors, you know, uh, essentially should be people that you look up to uh, uh, dead or alive, right? They can be uh, books that you read and leaders that you follow. It does not have to be somebody that you personally know. I think that uh, a mentor, at least from my experience, and someone that um, can uh, is more experienced with you in certain areas in life and can guide you through their mistakes. If you can learn from other people's mistakes and you know that they are, uh, they're uh, experienced enough and serious enough to give you a right decision, that's a mentor for me. And it can be your parents, it can be your, uh, you know, you, you, you know, your teachers, it can be anybody that you meet along the way and you see certain traits that we would like to imitate or to follow. For me, it was easy. I met those mentors during uh, my internship and training and residency, and everybody resonates in a different aspect on life. Some of them were uh, uh, personal mentors to my, my personal life. Some of them were neurosurgery mentors about teaching me how to be a better surgeon. Some of them were mentors about how to be a better parent. So it's not, it's not, it doesn't have to be necessarily very professional. It should be both professional and personal. And I think that it's kind of a feeling once you meet someone, you know that uh, you, you share same aspects of life and maybe share same aspects of, of career trajectory. And this is how at least I define, you know, I define a mentor and you can have multiple mentors on multiple aspects of life. That's my opinion. Yeah, I mean, one other thing I, I kind of noticed uh, kind of a trend through your talk is, you know, as, as an FMG, IMG, you know, you got on a plane, almost no questions asked. You just got up and left. And, um, and you know, not only that, you also talked about kind of not succeeding at this business that you were starting. So how do you let things like that little failure not, stop you from getting on that plane with the thought that I failed once I might fail again right I'm leaving my whole family behind I'm going to another place you know how do you kind of move on from moments like that where do you find the strength to kind of keep going you talk about grit perseverance things like that yeah that's very that's very uh that's very great question and I must say that you know uh you know fear is as a natural emotion and I feared a lot and you know I failed multiple times and and you should not be afraid of failure because failure is part of you know where you're getting it and I think that somebody said that um, life is full of failure right and your success is likely determined by your failure you just have to look at that as an opportunity to learn and it was very scary I have nothing to say going on an airplane and saying to my family I go to study medicine in Europe and or then going to the U.S. for those sebis and coming back and going back as an intern at NYU those are very scary moments and there is no I think there is no magic pill and there is no um you know, there, there is no one word or one sentence that I can or advice I can give. It just you have to be aware that this is very scary, especially for an FMG and IMG to go into those medical systems that you, you barely spoke the language. When I started NYU, I barely understood what you know people are talking to me in the medical in the medical jargon. So I was frightened, and I had you know I I'm not I'm, I'm very honest. I had panic attacks, and I had low times of my life when I was depressed. And I was very sad and I had nobody to rely on. So this is very common and normal emotions to have. You just don't have to feel bad about it and don't beat, about, beat yourself about it. The one thing that you do, I think, can benefit from is having those mentors along the way that have been through that process 
and been through that type of experience and to tell you, listen, everything is fine. Whatever you're feeling is just fine. Just push through the pain, push through the challenges. And this is what gets you growing, right? Because growth cannot happen without pain. And I think this is, you know, um, the one thing that I would say, the support system, your family and mentors are the one that helped me to push through all of those obstacles and challenges that were really hard and you cannot sugarcoat it. It was very hard. It was extremely hard. Yeah, no, absolutely. I can't imagine. Um, and listen, I, I, we've all, there's, everyone's got, like I said before, their journey and it's a different for everyone, but everyone's going to have these highs and lows and being able to kind of follow your passion through to what you want to do. Um, and also in a way, let it evolve, right? It's not necessarily the right thing or the wrong thing to say when you're like two years old, this is what I'm going to be with stay on that line, right? Some people do that. Other people bounce all around and, and everything is acceptable, right? There are no rules. And the only rule is there are no rules, right? Which is my favorite rule. Uh, Danilo, how you doing? Is he signed on or did he leave? No, I'm here. I'm just opening my laptop. Oh, okay. Just a couple minutes. Yeah, no worries. Take your time, but um, yeah, you know, I think the the oops, sorry, I think I muted myself. The the stories of how people got to this um are always super interesting, and um, and I think you know one one kind of lasting thing, Nadi, if you could give a, a little kind of insight into what kind of um FMGs, IMGs might want to think about when they're developing a tv right obviously the experiences matter um but you do have to have you know you have to have something written down you have to be able to show people what you've done um and so you know do you advise that people get in research at their home institution or do you advise that people get on a plane and go somewhere else what do you think so i so i think that the people right now on the call are very lucky and privileged because they have you randy so everybody that so everybody that here knows randy uh, knows how um, welcoming and supportive he is to, you know, IMGs and medical students in general. And most people don't have that. So I think that, you know, whenever you want to engage in those uh, foreign institutions and research and uh, letters of recommendations, which helped me a lot, find the right people. And uh, Randy, in fact, is one of them. So, you know, if I were you guy, I would just not hesitate and send him emails and messages because he answers all of them and he's super supportive and he helps a lot of people along the way. And this is what we're here for. We're here to help out. So, so I do think that letters of recommendations is extremely important from doing a SEB eyes or at least shadowing. This helps me a lot to kind of uh, show the American medical system that I'm not only validated in my home institution, but also in the U S and obviously when you're having superstars, uh like you know like like randy seriously that can recommend you and can send an email and can make a phone call this is what really makes it, the difference thanks Maddie. here wait i want to show you that i have the same background as you oh nice just live right. live image going from brooklyn nice this is about uh, about you know brain turn a river between Brooklyn and Manhattan. Uh, Danilo's in Westchester. You're uh, in your um, super sweet loft overlooking New York City. Uh, <laughs> and all these students- sitting in your there. office, but uh, you yeah. know, at least it looks like that. <laughs> Hold on, let me see what's going on. Um, sorry. Yeah, so um, Danilo, you know, man, I, I'm not sure uh, if you do need slides I want to just talk about your journey man I think um the students just like to hear a little variation in the theme right not everyone um gets to have a tv show I know I certainly didn't um so if you just want to talk kind of more of uh how you ended up you know in the U.S. and, and working in the city I think you know slides are you know great but not totally necessary I think he got he like left um I'm trying to find if he came back all right. Well, why don't we ask the students then? Does anyone have any questions? We'll open up the chat and we'll uh, try to address some of your guys' concerns and comments. I just want to say uh, one more thing, Randy, and I think that you, um, and I feel like you're going to share the same experience with me. When I was in, um, when, before med school and even starting, you know, before med school in high school, nobody of my teachers uh, foreseen any, any 
academic career for me. I was a total failure. In fact, uh, my um, uh, one of uh, one of my teachers told me, "Listen, nothing is going to come out of you. You should go consider learning to be a barber or hairstylist." And um, and, um, and, and you know that actually motivated me to um, to go ahead and do something else in my life than than being a barber. And all those no's, I must say, were big uh, motivators. And I know, Vanity, you also got a lot of no's in your life. And whenever you get no's in your life, this is at least for me a big you know a big motivator to to prove others that I can do I can do it better. So you know, don't be disencouraged when you get no's and you get rejections because rejection is part of life. You just have to look at every rejection as an opportunity to learn and a feedback, right? And you gain reference experiences in your life to make you deal with a bigger rejection for the next time. And I think this is what makes our interesting story, right? Uh, our story interesting because you might think that, oh, those guys were so good in high school and, and so good in med school, but no, I, I was terrible. I, I had severe learning difficulties and, and I started started med school thinking that I'm going to fail first semester. I actually called my mom and said, listen, this is not for me. Those people here are too smart. And I finished uh, third in my class after six years. I was the top 1% of my class. Was it because of my anxiety to fail? Maybe. Was it because my previous uh, reference experience of failing and failure? Maybe, but I ended up, you know, being, um, you know, the highest ranked in my in my in my medical school. Not because I was super smart, because I was really uh, encouraged and motivated to 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 be okay. And I think this is something that people should learn and know in this talk that nobody's cut from a different cloth. You know, the same, you know, nobody's cut from a different cloth. Don't think that if we're right now, if Randy is a superstar neurosurgeon in New York City or myself being a neuroplastic fellow at Hopkins have any special abilities. No, we don't. We are normal, the same as everybody else. We just push through the pain and push, you know, and have a big, um, I would say, uh, um, this for me motivation to to be something and push through the failures. And the most people you know, their highest limiting factor is themselves, not the surrounding, not others, not school, but their own limiting beliefs. So once you know how to work with your limiting beliefs and to channel your energy into positive outcome instead of a negative consequences, this is how you push through the, uh, you know, the difficult times in your life and ending up where we are right now. And, you know, I couldn't be more grateful and, and, uh, and happy. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, it's a it's a very very well taken point um i say it all the time i mean there's there's two components to that number one is you know for the high school students that are listening maybe even some of the college students you know you get in this journey and it's like a it's like a train ticket right you get on and you know where the train stops are going to be you know i'm stopping you know at, at you know 72nd street at 59th street 34th street you know where it's going to be and so you just kind of ride that train um but that's not what the rest of life is right once you get out of school you fall off a cliff you know, the train just, the train is going to a cliff and there's no train track, there's no bridge built, right? And so, you know, you start thinking it's better to get in the framework of well, what's my career going to be? What am I going to do with my life? And when you think about things like that, you realize that it's much more fluid. You can kind of, you know, design it any way you want, kind of lay those tracks wherever you want, or just, you know, fly basically when you jump off that cliff. And then the other thing is, um, like you mentioned, yeah, I agree a hundred percent. I'm definitely not smarter than a lot of people, but I can work harder than a lot of people. And it's because I'm driven by that goal, that career, by painting this kind of like picture that I want to paint for the rest of my life. And because of that, I can work harder than a lot of people, right? If you think about it, 99% of people are lazy. Um, and so if you can be that 1% of people who's willing to work for what you want to do, you're going to, you're going to succeed over the people who aren't willing to work as hard, um, no matter how smart you are, right? Um, but opportunities do matter. And I, and I do um, understand it and accept that, um, you know, some people are, don't have the opportunities that other people have. And that's why I thought that this talk would be important for, for those people in particular to hear, you know, kind of, you know, where you start from maybe, you know, more humble beginnings or more disadvantaged kind of setup, you know, how do you proceed at that point, right? How do you kind of, how do you kind of boost yourself up? And I think, you know, the mentorship part is a huge part of that, right? It's, it's kind of early on finding people who can influence your life and then looking at what they did and being reliable resource to those people. And then, you know, kind of expanding that network and hopefully, you know, you know, being the best person you can be and, and waiting for someone to recognize that, you know, um, and help you launch forward a little bit. 
Danilo, man, are you still texting me? Hold on. I was, uh, let me check it out. I don't think uh, Danilo is going to be able to come on. So we'll try to get him on another time. I think we lost him a little bit. Why don't we take a look at the chat? Um, Quinn, I can't read it because I'm, I'm still in a car. But um, can you ask us any of uh, the, you think the kind of good questions in there and we can try to address them? Um, well, first of all, they're all just saying thank you that this is a much needed talk. Um, they're asking- It's only day two. Can't be a much needed talk yet. <laughs> <laughs> they're asking for advice. Um, wait, let me scroll up a little bit. Do you think your military training has shaped your passion for plastic reconstruction? Like every asked about like military. That's, that's like that. a good that's a good question, and I uh, go and tell multiple stories about my military experience. But I was a I was a special forces paramedic, meaning that I was first in scene for a lot of uh, ex, you know terror attacks, gunshot wounds, you know special forces. Um, uh, military operations, meaning that I was mostly dealing with trauma. So trauma was a major, I would say, uh, you know, interest and I, I wouldn't say passion, but, um, but, you know, something that really shaped my, uh, my career path. And I wanted to, to be able to do something that involves trauma and neurosurgery. When I first threw neurosurgery, I saw trauma, I saw uh, plastics, I saw elective, I saw emergency, I saw peds, I saw adults, I saw spine. I knew right away that this is what I want to do, almost by a coincidence. I, I never knew that I'm going to go to neurosurgery until I was a PG-1 in general surgery, where I met Sean Rogers at NYU, and um, <clears throat> and I did a one month of, of, of neurosurgery. So yeah, I would say it's almost by mistake that, you know, that I, that I um, encountered this field and, and and, st and pursued a career. So my military experience definitely shaped the way I look at things and see the world. And for my professional or career um, uh, decisions, definitely I wanted to do trauma that, you know, I had a lot of experience with during my military service. Um, there's a lot of questions about what are the best ways to go about getting clinical experiences abroad in med school as an IMG. Randy, do you want to answer that? Sorry, what was the question? I was um, I was trying to get uh, directions somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> they asked, what are the best ways to go about getting clinical experiences abroad in med school as an IMG? You know, is this, so I think, you know, the question is, is how do you get into, I guess, a program not in your country, right? Uh, how do you introduce yourself? How do you... Um, establish that connection to be able to go in and you know unfortunately every single program is different um and so it's hard to say um i will tell you as a resident not so much as, as a med student but as a resident at, at columbia now as an attending at lennox hill i get asked probably once a week maybe twice a week for a student to come from overseas and there are periods of time where that's very possible like summers and and winter breaks and there are other periods of time where that's very difficult to do um, but your first step is reaching out, right? You identify a place where you like what people are doing or you like a personality and you want to meet them and you, you cold call or cold email, right? Um, you know, for the most part, most, uh, most emails are accessible, unfortunately, because I get a lot of emails. <laughs> but I think, um, you know, you got to get out there and you present them with what your interests are and your CV and why you think you're a good candidate. And they may ask for a CV or may ask you to write a letter of intent of some sort. Sorry, I'm in a tunnel now. And um, I think it's just, you know, you just put yourself out there. Now, um, it's limited. Again, certain places will have more formal relationships where they can help you with a visa. You could spend ex extended period of time. You could come for a year. You could come for six months, whatever. Other places, which is something that I've kind of just done, says, you know what? You're on a two-week break. Come hang out. Well, you can just shadow. Um, it depends what you want to get out of it, you know? If you want to contribute to research, you know, you, you maybe do that two week shadow to meet someone and then you set up that relationship. You get that little like nudge with that person. They, they can rely on you. They trust you. You get along personality wise. Then you reach back out and you say, I want to come spend six months with you or a year with you. Um, and, you know, uh, without a doubt, if you're trying to practice in the States, your career path is going to be different than someone in the States going through the system, going med school, residency, attending. 
right? There might be a year or two where you're doing something else. And that's why I think Danilo's story was really interesting because Danilo has done, you know, multiple fellowships and now he's done multiple fellowships as well. And, you know, that, that course is always a little bit different, but, you know, the most important thing anyone can do is establish relationships. Um, how you go about doing that is up to you. Always be civilized, please. Always be respectful and, you know, always put your best foot forward and do your hardest work. And, you know, be true to yourself. If you're extremely passionate about it, it's going to, it's going to come through in the work that you do. If you, if you say that you want to help someone and they go out on a limb to bring you in and you do half-ass stuff, you know, ultimately it's going to come back to hurt you more than help you. Right. Um, and so you just gotta, that's kind of my best advice for that. But I, I think you just gotta identify where you want to be, who you want to be with, and then, you know, take that plunge, you know, not, got on freaking planes. <laughs> Also, so, oh, it's yeah. right, I think. No, go ahead. Uh, there's a lot of questions still about mentoring, and I know we touched on it already, but they're saying that they don't really know how to talk to their mentor. I'm not yeah. sure what to ask. Here, ask I'm gonna, I say. So different places, again, different personalities. I'll tell you this. Every mentor that you have. Sorry to you. Oh, sorry. Go to uh, Freedom Place. Yeah, that's fine. Like it's here. Yeah, okay. yeah, that's fine. Sorry, guys. I'm going to cry. Actually, you know, you know, man, actually, on, when Broadway turns north here, I'll jump out. That's fine. Broadway? No, 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 right here. If you make the, uh, if you, right here at the next block, I'll jump out. I can walk from there. That's fine. It's up to you. Sorry, guys. So, um, anyway, so uh, what I was going to say, though, is um, every, all these people are human beings, right? So talk to them like you would talk to a human being. Um, you know, they understand, you know, medical students. They've been doing this their whole life. You're not the first med student they've had. You're not going to be the last. Um, and so just be a human being. Don't be like a robot. Don't be a weirdo. Just be yourself and be a human being and offer assistance. And most people want assistance. And if, and if you offer assistance and they don't want it, you know, try to provide assistance. Sometimes, you know, you just become helpful by being involved and around and things like that. Um, but just, yeah, I think step one is don't be, don't be a total uh, weirdo. <laughs> I don't know if that's helpful or not. But listen, guys, it's 10 to 12. Why don't we cut a little early? I got to get out of this car anyway. Nadi, thank you so much. Danilo, thank you so much for showing up, even though it didn't work out. And um, it's been a real privilege. So Quinn, why don't you send us off, okay? Okay, thank you, everyone. I'm going to post um, what tomorrow's talk is about. Um, and Brendan sent me his slides, so I'm going to post those. And he said to give him a follow on Twitter at, I'll put it in the chat right now. Um, and I'll see you at the same time tomorrow. Bye everyone. And thank you, Nati.